Hi everyone. In this video, I'm going to be talking to you about the OWASP top 10 in 2025. What's new, what's changed and what it means to you, especially for your applications for the next four years or so. So let's get started and let's get started now. Now, before I get started with the OWASP top 10 2025, I just want to quickly clarify what the OWASP top 10 actually is and what it's meant to be. Now, the OWASP top 10 is a list of top 10 vulnerabilities or classes of vulnerabilities that can affect applications every so often. The list is updated every four years. Every four years, the OWASP Foundation, which is the Open Web Application Security Project, the foundation reaches out to the broader community, gets information about the type of vulnerabilities affecting their application. So they do this sort of a sanitized process where they get a ton of data from different sources, from different companies, from different security providers and so on. And then they collate all of those results to identify which are the vulnerabilities or the top 10 classes of vulnerabilities that are affecting applications at this point in time. This list is not just a list of 10 vulnerabilities. A lot of people assume that this is a list of 10 vulnerabilities. It's not. It is a list of 10 classes of vulnerabilities, which essentially means that these are families of flaws, so to speak, where each vulnerability can be manifested in multiple different ways. So for instance, I might have an authentication flaw because of password issues, or I might have authentication flaws because of not validating my token issues. So either way, there are authentication flaws. So the overall class or the category would be authentication flaws, but there would be several vulnerabilities within that class of flaws. So please understand that the OWASP top 10 is not for single vulnerabilities. The top 10 list is a class of vulnerability list, a thing that they talk about. The other thing that I want to warn about before I go into this video is that the OWASP top 10 is not meant to be the only type of or the most comprehensive list of vulnerabilities. That's not what it's meant to be. It's meant to be a point in time snapshot of the most critical issues that are typically affecting applications. It's more meant to be an awareness driven document that can help you and your developers identify what are the key issues that they're likely dealing with and of course, deal with these issues. Does that mean that other flaws or other vulnerabilities are not important? Of course, it does not. It does not mean that. It means that at this given point in time, this is what we're typically seeing, and it's meant to drive awareness towards better application security for all of us. The idea is that it drives awareness, it drives the management directive, it also drives some of that, it also drives some parameters in terms of what you should be looking for. It also drives priorities perhaps in some cases, but do not make this the be all and end all of vulnerability lists. It's a list of top 10 and that's what it's meant to be. So with that out of the way, I'm going to get started in exploring what are these top 10 flaws and then we are going to get started exploring some of the changes that have happened. I'm going to make this video more about the changes rather than the individual flaws themselves because the individual flaws have been covered ad nauseum by several people. All right, so let's talk about some of the changes that have happened between 2021 and 2025. This is the website called oasp.org slash top 10 and I highly recommend all of you take a look at this when you can. It gives you additional information. It also gives you some very useful information about individual vulnerabilities and so on. Now let's talk a little bit about the 2025 and the 2021 changes. So the 2025 list looks like this. This is still a release candidate one. I think they have to still finalize this, but I think this is what it's likely to look like. So it's going to be one which is broken access control. No prizes for guessing. This is the most common, most pernicious vulnerability in the age of cloud AI and modern web applications or any applications for that matter. This is going to be the biggest issue that you deal with. Access control issues have become front and center. I think we have gone past the point of injection and so on where you know that has reduced in its scope and you don't see that as much anymore but you still see a ton of access control issues and that is something that remains unchanged. Security misconfiguration remains unchanged. It's very important that it is, it shows as if it's moved up, so to speak, but I don't consider this a list of moving up or moving down. I would say that there's just 10 of these and I would still focus on all 10 as a area of focus rather than just trying to say that, okay, this is something that is newer or this is higher than the other or something like that. 
Right. So this is security misconfiguration has also been around for a while now. It was there in 2021 and it also happens to be there in 2025, which is understandable. A3 is something that I find very useful because this is talking about software supply chain failures. Now, this used to be vulnerable and outdated components, which it does not really capture the whole extent of software supply chain failures. I like the fact that they've done this simply because this addresses the whole broader scope of the issue rather than just vulnerable and outdated components. Software supply chain is much more than just vulnerable and outdated components. It also refers to your CI CD issues, your vulnerabilities in build environments. It also refers to third party, of course, your software, outdated components and so on, vulnerable components. It also refers to the way your CI CD is configured, your build, the CI CD system itself, as well as any other type of software supply chain element that is part of your development and deployment environment. It could be infrastructure as code and so on. It could be multiple things. And I, I'm glad they have done this. I'm glad they have captured this as an issue because this is a big issue and I'm glad they have taken this into account. The fourth one is cryptographic failures that still exists. Now, cryptographic failures still exist in 2021 and in 2025, rightfully so, simply because cryptographic failures are pretty big issues, especially now with AI-enabled applications coming into the picture. Cryptographic failures are likely to be a bigger and bigger and bigger issue, especially because secrets management and in general protection of secrets and cryptographic parameters is going to be a lot more important in the age of AI. Injection still exists. Injection has not gone away. Injection doesn't only mean SQL injection, mind you. Injection means SQL injection, command injection. I would even include something like a prompt injection and indirect prompt injection in there. I don't know whether they have. Let's actually see whether they have. Okay, looks like they have. Okay, a related class of injection. Yes, so it clearly means that they have considered this. I would say that in the overall space of injection, I would say that prompt injection and the new types of injection that you have beyond just SQL injection is going to get more and more critical. So there's template injection, there's prompt injection, there's all different types of injections. I would say all of them are very valid and especially now with LLMs coming into the picture, injection still has a pride of place in the OWASP top 10 2025, which is very important. The other one is insecure design. Now, this is something that came up last day in 2021 as well. They spoke about, oh, I guess it was not, right? They used to call it, yeah, oh, insecure design. Yeah, they called it insecure design 2021 as well. So insecure design is also a flaw. Now, this was controversial in 2021, and I still feel it would be considered a little controversial now because insecure design kind of is like everything, right? Your authentication issue is a design issue. Your authorization issues are related to design. Cryptographic failures are related to design. Injection in many cases is related to design. Software and data integrity failures related to design. So this ends up being a little bit of a catch-all, but I would still say that this is a good thing to add simply because this encourages people to do things like threat modeling, which is very important. So a lot of companies have this kind of horse blinders approach to say that we need to be OWASP top 10 compliant. Right? That means Nothing in the real world, but a lot of times they want to do that and they have a certain requirement from somebody to do that. And that helps when you do things like this and you have requirements like insecure design. In my view, it's a little simplistic, but in many views, this is important because this encourages a dialogue that actually results in people doing threat modeling or doing things that relate to reduction of challenges that happen because of insecure design. So this is a very important category. I think it's, it's important that it's there, although I'm not a huge fan of it being there in a list of vulnerabilities that itself is not a vulnerability, but I would say that it is definitely an issue or a process issue that needs to be dealt with. Now, one of the things that has happened is that SSRF has gone away. You will see that SSRF has gone away. You don't see SSRF in 2025 simply because SSRF really goes back to its roots of being an access control flaw. SSRF really is an access control flaw. The fact that I am able to use a URL parameter and able to access things that I'm not supposed to access is classically an access control issue. So all of these are access control issues and SSRF has now been subsumed under the category of broken access control. 
Of course, authentication failures continue to exist. Now, I think they've been made a little bit broader to include additional things, but by and large, authentication failures still continue to exist as is. They've not changed by much. Same with software and data integrity failures. These are, you're dealing with, you know, XXE or insecure deserialization. Those issues that deal with integrity challenges, those are the issues that you're dealing with here. So those are data integrity failure issues that you're talking about. Now let's pay a little bit of attention to the last two categories, especially the last one, which is a new one, entirely a new category. Let's talk about the logging and alerting failures. Now logging and alerting failures used to be called security logging and monitoring failures. Now I would say that I'm glad that they've added this and continued to keep this simply because logging and monitoring is something that is extensively required for applications today. If you don't do a good job of logging and if you don't have logs that are alertable in the sense that you don't have logs that are structured, that can be queried, that can be used for alerting, then it becomes a huge challenge for your security program. So I'm glad that they've kept this. It's important to have this. You also deal with other monitoring things like SAS, DAS and stuff like that. But for me, really logging and alerting is something that is a very underrated category that was underrated when it came out in 2021. I'm glad that it did. And they've stuck to it in 2025, which means that there is a huge amount of impetus being given to this, which I'm very glad to see and glad to hear. So this is something that I think is a very important move. Now, the last one is the new one, mishandling of exceptional conditions. Now, mishandling of exceptional conditions is very much an important parameter. I would say it doesn't get the kind of importance it should get because your application has exception states. You throw exceptions, you have exceptions. A lot of times those exceptions reveal a lot of information about the system. A lot of those times those exceptions can cause all kinds of other bugs like race conditions and fraudulent transactions and authorization issues and all of that stuff. So remember that exception handling is a very important aspect of secure coding. And the fact that we have not added this as a top 10 issue is a pretty serious issue. And especially because, and I think also, I don't know whether they've considered this as part of the reason they've added this. I would say that this is going to be a huge impact when it comes to AI enabled applications, agents, and so on, simply because all of these applications can produce, they are, they are probabilistic in nature. They can produce exceptions. They can't produce error states. A lot of times these error states can have very, very divulging sort of behaviors or behaviors that can cause people to be able to understand the workings of the system, to be able to penetrate it or compromise it in the future. So this, I would say is a very important requirement. It's definitely something that has not been added so far, but I'm glad they've added it now. They removed, I think it was there in the early OWASP top tens, insecure error handling or something. I don't remember anymore, but in 2021, it was not there. In 2025, it's there. I'm glad they've added it. It does make a lot of sense. So this is the overall changes that have happened in the OWASP top 10. I think it's very important for you to go through this. And if you are somebody who's using AppSec Engineer, either as an enterprise user or as a regular user, you have all of this on AppSec Engineer and we're probably going to make them a specific journey for OWASP top 10 2025 soon. So definitely keep on the lookout for that. And yeah, this is something that I wanted to talk about. Thank you all for watching and I hope to see you in the next video. Thank you so much.